Knives in the Dark, Bloodthirsty Assassins and Diablerists, or Misunderstood Warriors, Scholars, and Guardians? Your blood is anathema to me, but the act of spilling it brings me closer to Hakim. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Masquerade Monday and a new lore video about everyone's favorite assassins, the Banu Hakim. The Banu Hakim, sometimes known ignorantly or unfavorably as Asimites to the rest of the kindred, are true independents and mercenaries, hiring out to whoever can pay their blood price. By the time a mark realizes that they're being hunted by a Banu Hakim, it's often far too late. Needless to say, this makes the Banu Hakim both feared and reviled by many of the other clans. In truth, the Banu Hakim are more than simple thugs and killers. Theirs is a complex but insular clan predicated upon three principles of wisdom, sorcery, and diablery. Most Banu Hakim that other vampires encounter are members of the warrior caste. Therefore, kindred society has painted them all with that same brush. For their part, the assassins have done nothing to stop this misunderstanding. If it helps them acquire contracts and it occludes the true nature of their clan, the better for them. Long ago, the Asimites were brought to heal by a powerful curse to curb their bloodlust, levied by the Tremere at the behest of the Camarilla. I made videos about both the Camarilla and the Tremere, the first of which you can watch here. This curse resulted in the Banu Hakim being unable to taste the Vitae of vampires without it causing them harm. In their ongoing quest to lower their generation and bring themselves closer to their holy figure, Hakim, the assassins must refine the blood of kindred into an alchemical solution. Were it not for this mystical yoke, the Banu Hakim would surely be unchecked on a crusade of unholy diablery. From the beginning, the Banu Hakim were an isolated lot, centered around Alamut and the Middle East. Lacking competition for certain roles due to the relative absence of other clans, the clan thus maintained its separation of duties over the millennia, rather than becoming specialized to one particular mode of existence. The viziers tended to the mortal herds, the judges, now known as the warriors, tended to the clan's defense, and the sorcerers pursued their mystical secrets. This division of labor allowed the Banu Hakim to succeed on their own, where a clan priding itself on one specialization, such as the Noble Ventru or the Socialite Toreador, would have failed. I also made videos about both of these clans, the first of which you can watch here. The Banu Hakim associated rarely with other Cainites, but small cabals supported various mortal nations, entangling themselves within the Jihad, which ultimately ended in such profound enragement of their antediluvian that he left Alamut, occasionally visiting it, but never staying for long until he disappeared completely. Hakim, the hunter, is the antediluvian who founded the Asimite clan. Hakim was a warrior hunter who, after being embraced, by whom is still debated by kindred, made havens in both the first and second cities, promoting neutrality amongst bickering kindred brethren. I'll be discussing the first and second cities in an upcoming lore video about Cain. The rise of Western civilization brought the Banu Hakim into close contact with the rest of the Cainite world. During the time of the Greek city-states and the height of Persian dominance, few clans other than the Bruja, Ravnos, Setites, and the Tsimichi had enjoyed more than sporadic encounters with the children of Hakim. However, as Rome expanded and later as Byzantium rose, the Cainite presence rose with them. The Banu Hakim never had an extensive role in the Roman Empire's life or death. Scattered members of all three castes moved through Roman society, particularly in the eastern and southern regions of the empire, and no few warriors found mercenary employment as bodyguards or household troop commanders for wealthy Ventru and Malkavians. After the destruction of Carthage and the growing expansion of the empire into the Middle East, most Banu Hakim abandoned the city. Rome was never a place of particular interest for the assassins, but the Parthian Empire began to become one. Arising in Persia a century before Rome's ascent began, Parthia spread through the Mesopotamian region in the wake of the crumbling Seleucid dynasty. Many Banu Hakim encouraged the Parthian in expansion, save for those who had maintained close ties to the Seleucids. Some saw Parthia as a rich ground on which to sate their particular hungers, whether for vitae, battle, or learning, while others simply welcomed an end to the chaotic infighting that surrounded their homes. Parthia quickly became all too significant to the assassins as the force holding the Roman Cainites at bay. All three castes devoted themselves to reinforcing the mortals who could fend off their undead adversaries. The Banu Hakim of the Dark Ages were strongly unified, following a tumultuous period where the clan was split by those who followed Islam and those who chose not to. Some Banu Hakim even renounced their clan membership, becoming dispossessed. 
It took the threat of the Bali, a bloodline of vampires associated with demon worship, destroying the clan entirely for them to come together again. In the 7th century, the Bali had once again reformed, and the Banu Hakim were ready to strike them down. It was during their siege on the tainted Acropolis of Chorazin that the Bali unleashed their curse of hunger upon the warriors, arising an insatiable thirst for Vitae within them. Neonate and Methuselah alike fell prey to a dreadful hunger that could be satisfied only by the Vitae of other Canites. As the curse spread across the castes, the sorcerers and viziers searched in vain for a way to break it. By the end of the 14th century, the entire warrior caste and most sorcerers and viziers were afflicted. The vast majority of the Banu Hakim also became Muslim during this time, with a select few keeping other faiths. The children of Hakim kept quite busy because of the Western vampire clans during this time as well. The Crusades enabled the Western Canaanites to invade the lands of the Banu Hakim. In addition, their greedy and corrupting ways had hurt and diminished the herds the Banu Hakim had so carefully developed and tended to, as well as the mortal families of the assassins that many of the clans still held in some regard. In response, the Banu Hakim worked to rid themselves of these invaders once and for all, and restore their own power. For centuries, the children of Hakim also refused to officially embrace women, although this policy seems to have changed by the time of the Fourth Crusade. Although the Banu Hakim considered themselves noble, the Western vampires saw them as little more than meddling, corrupt, heretic foreigners. Many of the Banu Hakim worked hand-in-hand -hand with the Ashira, the sect under which Islamic vampires declare their faith in Allah to keep the Europeans out. The Inquisition, an organization within the Roman Catholic Church tasked to rid the world of evil and heresy in all its forms in the name of God, never really touched the Holy Land nor did it extend into the Ottoman Empire or parts farther east. While the Banu Hakim regained their strength from the battles of the Crusades and the aftershock of the Bali curse, the European elders sacrificed their childer to the Inquisition for the hope of another night's survival. Too many of those intended victims fled east, preferring to take their chances there than with their sire's betrayals and the church's flame-lit crosses. When the sentiments among the Childer boiled up and the Anarch Revolt began, the Banu Hakim followed, slaying many Canites and gaining their reputation as a clan of cannibalistic assassins and murderers, a sentiment that many warriors encouraged to flourish. I discussed the Anarch Revolt in my video on the Tsumichi, which you can watch here. When the Camarilla was founded at the Convention of Thorns, many Anarchs chose to ally with them instead of continuing their struggles. This enraged many Banu Hakim operating in Europe who saw their erstwhile allies deserting them for the promise of sanctuary that they could have earned for themselves anyway if they had possessed the strength to continue their fight. They turned their attention to the Camarilla with a fury born of betrayal. It was only after a lone Nosferatu discovered the location of Alamut that the Banu Hakim yielded and submitted to a truce called the Treaty of Tyre and the Blood Curse of the Tremir. The Banu Hakim did not fare well during the Victorian Age. Still suffering the effects of the curse levied upon them by the Tremere, the assassin presence in the larger Canite community was negligible. Most Banu Hakim stayed on or near Alamut, retaining their strength for the day when they could travel with impunity through the lands of the brood of Cain once again. European colonialism had little direct effect on the assassins themselves, but resulted in significant portions of their mortal herd being dominated by one Western power or another. Egypt, in particular, was hit hard when the British assumed control. The sole good thing to come from Victorian-era imperialism was that disquieted, fanatic humans with a motivation to study the arts of killing were easy to find and recruit. In the modern nights, the awakening of ur -Shulgi, one of the first sorcerers and child of Hakim himself, brought rapid changes on the clan as a whole. The ancient Methuselah used his tremendous power to break the curse laid upon the clan, succeeding where other sorcerers had worked for hundreds of years without success. Strangely, Urshulgi broke only the Tremere curse, not the one from the Bali, a curse which persisted for so long that even most within the clan weren't aware that it was their original curse. This certainly demonstrated his power and drew many to his cause, but still a lot of the sorcerers and viziers wondered, why didn't Urshulgi similarly sweep aside the Bali curse? Was he unable to do so, or perhaps simply unwilling? A curious question. 
His harsh views and interpretations of the clan laws, also called the laws of Hakim, however, triggered various struggles and discomforts, which resulted in what is commonly called the schism. The caste split apart during the schism, and Urshalgi demanded that other Banu Hakim give up the worship of any other gods and only revere Hakim. This resulted in many assassins being killed and many more opting to leave Alamut. Urshalgi was particularly vicious towards Muslim assassins and killed several elders for refusing to renounce their faith, including including the head of the warrior caste. Some Banu Hakim joined the Camarilla. Most of those that joined were viziers and sorcerers. Warriors that joined the Camarilla are generally seen as loose cannons who must be supervised by their more restrained and non-vitae addicted sectmates. Sorcerers in the Camarilla find their skills in high demand as an alternative to dealing with the Tremere. A small number of the clan, mostly warriors, joined the Sabbat. While the Banu Hakim and Tichibu, who had been with the Sabbat for the last 500 years or so, were entirely from the warrior stock, the warriors opting to join the Sabbat were not entirely welcomed with open arms. Many of the Banu Hakim and Tichibu elders had defected and left the Sabbat to return to the main clan. This meant the Sabbat was not entirely welcoming due to the recent betrayal. Few sorcerers or viziers joined the Sabbat. Some Banu Hakim chose to go completely independent and avoid all the sects. They also drew away from the main clan primarily for religious reasons. Few warriors chose this option. Most dispossessed are viziers and sorcerers. An insular hierarchy shapes much of Banu Hakim's organization. The Old Man on the Mountain, the master assassin who makes his haven in the mountain fortress of Alamut, is the ultimate authority, and the clan heeds the orders that trickle down to them with a mix of reverence and terror. Individual and local cells of Asimites known as Falaki frequently have license to act with autonomy, and until recently, the main clan was strongly unified. The Council of Scrolls was responsible for introducing new technology into the clan and investigating recent developments outside Alamut, while the Council of Duat formulated clan policy and was composed of the representatives of each caste. The Caliph for the Warrior's caste, the Amr for the Sorcerer's caste, and the Vizier for the Vizier's caste. Apart from these, the Banu Hakim have never formally defined any positions. However, the warriors have evolved a series of ranks that represent an individual standing within the caste, and the sorcerers and viziers have cooperatively maintained an academic and professional ranking scheme for centuries. The three Banu Hakim castes may be considered separate clan variants for the purposes of sire-child relations. A warrior will always sire warrior-childer, and a vizier will always beget viziers and so on. But all three castes are Banu Hakim. Their vitae is indistinguishable except under the most acute thaumaturgical observation. Arguably, the assassins have no one caste that is more Hakim than the others, at least in matters of descent. All children of Hakim are childer of their ancestor. Sorcerers are the smallest caste, but the second most recognizable. They claim to have practiced blood sorcery since the times of the Second City, and to have been created to counter the dark magics employed by the Bali. Their magic was originally based off of ancient Mesopotamian priestly rituals and the Persian cult of Mithras, but modern sorcerers now incorporate the ecstatic Hindu devotion to Kali and Shiva, Chinese Feng Shui, and Islamic alchemy and astrology as well. Sorcerers usually need to send themselves into some sort of alternative altered state of consciousness in order to focus their magics. This may involve consuming drugs, whirling themselves into a trance, ritually wounding themselves, or even more exotic methods. Their weakness comes from their lust for magical power. A sorcerer's aura is so stained with magic that there is little way to mistake him for anything else. They also have trouble using powers to hide themselves due to their blazing auras. Viziers are the least known caste of the Asimite clan, however they are the oldest, at least according to themselves. Viziers are the scholars and artisans of the clan. In many ways, they are similar to the Toreador, but where the Toreador become lost in contemplation, the viziers explode in frenzied creative activity. Viziers lust after knowledge or artistic perfection. They suffer from an obsessive compulsive derangement that causes them to pursue their art with fervent tenacity. A vizier in the throes of his derangement will pursue it to the exclusion of all other activities. His aura will blaze with madness. Vampires with auspex may be able to discern exactly what it is he so doggedly pursues. The vizier's caste culture may be best described as a very loose affiliation of individualists. Viziers tend to keep to themselves unless involved in a mentor-protege arrangement or conducting some cooperative venture. However, the schism and the subsequent alliance with the Camarilla has allowed many viziers to exist relatively openly among other Canites, and many have chosen to enter social and political arenas, with 
varying degrees of success. The Asamite and Titribu are almost identical to their non-Sabat counterparts. Also, most importantly, they were never subjected to the curse of the Tremere. The Asamites of the Sabat are free to drink the blood of all vampires. Because of this, they may be considered a separate bloodline from all other Asamites. Sorcerer Cast and Titribu refer to themselves as Al-Aziz. The Asamites of the Sabat, acting on the request of the sex leaders, severed all direct association to the Asamite clan. The Sabat Asamites have since that time made peace with their former clan, however. Asamite and Titribu will not battle non-Sabat Asamites, and Asamites have never warred against the Sabat Asamites. This unspoken understanding is at least recognized by Sabat leaders. The Asamite and Titribu are the primary assassins of the Sabbat. However, they do not ask for blood from the leaders of the sect. Instead, they ritually slay the eldest of their own clan every 100 years through a special diablerie ceremony. The Elder exists for a century as the closest Asamite and Titribu to Cain himself, ruling under the title Hulul. At the end of the 100-year reign, the next in line drinks the precious vitae from the previous ruler, and so it passes through history. With the breaking of the Tremere curse by Urshulgi, many elders of the Antitribu, including the current Halul, have abandoned the sect and returned to Alamut to join the Loyalist forces. Conversely, many young Asamites have fled to the Sabat in order to escape the harsh laws under Urshulgi. The Bedouins are a small nomadic bloodline of the warrior caste, native to North Africa, that practices animalism and makes extensive use of ghoul predators and warhorses to maintain their dominion over the thinly populated wastelands that they call Call home. They come primarily from mortal Bedouin and Berber stock. These individuals hold no sectarian allegiance and are only nominally loyal to Alamut, preferring to be left alone. The courtiers began with a group from the vizier caste who involved themselves in Byzantine politics during the heyday of that empire and came to favor presence over celerity, a preference they passed on to their descendants. About two dozen members of the bloodline currently exist, most of whom reside in the Middle East, pursuing their own agendas among the Ashira. As a whole, the children of Hakim hold themselves apart from the political squabbles of other Canaanites. This is due in part to geography, at least before the advent of mechanized transportation, but mainly to a subtle sense of superiority. The children like to feel that they have no need to resort to politics to achieve their aims. This is not to say that no member of the line is incapable of subtlety, but rather that the clan culture, such as it is, is predisposed toward more direct solutions. Of course, this political isolation has also had its drawbacks. Absence from the intrigues of the undead means lack of enemies, but also of allies, which resulted in the isolated stance of the clan after the formation of the Camarilla. Also, most Asamites are inexperienced in the games of power and jihad other kindred have played for millennia. In all versions besides version 5, the Banu Hakim grow dark with age. However, in the 5th edition, Banu Hakim are drawn to feed from those deserving punishment. The signature discipline of the Asamites is quietus, which grants them influence over the blood of others. Asamites often share communal havens with others, remote structures that allow the assassins to watch their larger domain from a distance. These havens are generally well appointed, but not so lavish that the whole place can't be moved on short notice. Individual Asamites also tend to keep personal hideouts of a much more humble nature for when they need a place to lay low. Older Asamites often come from Middle Eastern and North African cultures, though more and more young Asamites come from a wider demographic. In traditional environments, the Asamites prefer garb appropriate to religious or clan custom. When in public, however, Asamites wear whatever the locals do, allowing them to fulfill their contracts without anyone noticing anything amiss. Those embraced into clan Asamite tend to fall into two distinct types, the provincial members of the clan fit whatever their locality is and can blend seamlessly in with the people around them. The higher profile jet setters transcend cultures, bolstered by their ability to handle interpersonal and intellectual challenges. The clan tends to watch potential neonates before allowing an Asamite to sire progeny. Although necessity sometimes demands that a new child be sired quickly, the Asamites prefer making time for an apprenticeship. The Asamite Antitribu are strict in choosing recruits. If a newly created Asamite Antitribu survives his first experience in combat, he becomes a Mustajib, or deserving one. Mortals never serve the Asamites before being chosen to become one. Only after becoming vampires do they get the chance for acceptance. For a period of seven years, the vampire must serve the Asamite Antitribu who created him. If the Mustajib fails in any of his tasks, he is destroyed. If he succeeds, he becomes Fides, or one who sacrifices himself. 
himself for seven more years as he serves as creator. Asamites typically try to embrace someone who will be useful to the clan as a whole. This often means someone who will be willing to fight and die for the clan's, or at least their sire's, goals. However, during the long period that the clan labored under the Tremere blood curse, people may also have been embraced for knowledge in a specific or obscure area. Typically, this had something to do with sorcery or medical research involving blood, but may also have included more esoteric areas of research as well. Asamites typically choose people with somewhat obsessive personalities for the embrace. As they are typically involved with either hunting down miscreants or conducting arcane research, they tend to be highly motivated individuals. This often results in Asamites picking individuals who are fanatically devoted to a cause, religion, theory, or activity. The various cast flaws and the training they undergo after the embrace tends to accentuate this even more. Thus, Asamites can be said to select Childer that will be eager to chase down their prey no matter how long it takes, or how far they must go. That prey may be a physical target, little-known piece of knowledge, or even pursuing the perfection of an art form. When thinking of the Asamites, most other vampires assume they will be Muslim. While they do draw the majority of their childer from the Middle East and other Muslim countries, this does not mean all Asamites are Muslims. While most are, and some Asamites from pre-Islamic times converted, it is not considered the official Asamite religion by any stretch of the imagination. Many elder Asamites come from pre-Islamic cultures practicing some form of animism or ancestor worship. Some are Jews, Christians, or Zoroastrians, as these were also common in the area before the coming of Islam, and are still present in the modern era, though to a lesser extent. Virtually any religious background is acceptable for an Asamite, being Muslim is just the most likely. Asamites tend to embrace more men than women overall, with the exact ratios varying with time and depending on caste. Warriors typically embrace far more men than women, the thinking being that women are less likely to have the skills that warriors favor, tend to be physically smaller and less aggressive than men. That they were typically married off young and were raising children also limited the number embraced as warriors. Female warriors thus tend to have unusual skills or backgrounds that lead to their embrace. Some may have disguised themselves as men to fight, be skilled with more subtle means of assassination, such as poison, or less physical aspects of warfare, such as diplomacy. Viziers and sorcerers are less focused on the physical skills of their childer, and thus more likely to embrace women. The number of women embraced waxed and waned based on the overall attitude towards educating women. In periods where women were rarely taught to read or write, they naturally took fewer women. However, in periods where few people were educated, a vizier might take someone for their skill with art or social acumen, even if they were illiterate. Similarly, a sorcerer might embrace someone who showed some innate knack for magic, even if they could not write their own name. After all, childer could be taught to read and write after the embrace. Men typically had a head start on education, however, making them a more likely choice. Age-wise, embraces were also skewed by caste. With their emphasis on physical pursuits, Asamite warriors typically favored the young and fit. Thus, most warriors with an older physical appearance were probably embraced for their skills with leadership or tactics, rather than raw physical might. Older warriors may also have been embraced for skills in an area that take a lifetime to master, such as blacksmithing, constructing siege weapons, or more minor weapons and fighting styles. It is unlikely that a warrior would embrace anyone with a severe physical ailment. Viziers and sorcerers typically place greater emphasis on learning and mental skills. While an exceptionally smart or artistically talented individual may catch their eye while still young, they are more likely to select someone who has spent a lifetime learning or perfecting their skills. Thus, many sorcerers and viziers may be of an advanced physical age, reflecting years of study before their embrace. As auspects can also help compensate for the slow loss of hearing or sight with age, viziers in particular may consider embracing an individual with a sound mind, but infirm body. According to Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary Edition, these are some of the Asamite opinions on the other clans and factions. Where they are blatant, we are subtle, and that is why they are a broken clan, and we are ascendant. Humility before God is itself divine, but certainly not humility before their unclean god. When the blade bites deeply, they die as readily as all other kindred. They value their independence as we do, but they squander it in unholy debauchery. For all their posturing, they are quick to pay our fees and hire our knives. In the parable of the scorpion and the frog, they play the roles of both doomed creatures. Make yourself known to them, and they will acknowledge their place. We kill to honor our god. They kill to avenge a wittier remark. They bear old grudges against us. Meet them with a wary eye. 
Vultures picking at the corpse of a long-gone nobility. Tower built in Babel by Icarus. They profane what is holy and pretend it is an eminent glory. The wisest of the tribes because they know when to admit they don't know. Now I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments. What do you think about the Banu Hakim? Do you think we'll meet some in Bloodlines too? How would you feel if you were embraced into their clan? What clan do you think I'm covering next? I make videos multiple times a week and every Monday is Masquerade Monday, so if you enjoy what I do, please consider hitting that subscribe button. A massive thank you to Ian Watson, aka Fun Aether, for his help with compiling the info for this video and for offering insight into Vampire the Masquerade lore. These videos literally could not be made without him. Thank you so very much for watching, it means the absolute world to me, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!